Welcome in to the Think Deeper podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joe Wilkie, joined as always by Jack Wilkie and Will Harib. And today we have a pretty interesting episode, uh, what I think is going to be pretty interesting, and we're excited about it. But before we get into that, I wanted to talk about a couple other things we have upcoming. We keep talking about all the things we're, we're doing. And first, we have a book, my book. Uh, it is a quick guide. It should not be too many pages. Uh, by the time it's it's headed to the printer, we are going to be taking pre-orders. It is the quick guide to getting out of porn. It's going to be a kind of a companion piece to the podcast, my Get Out of Porn podcast, um, and we're hoping that that's going to be uh, just a resource for people that might need it. Like I said, it's very quick. It's a nine-step thing, a few pages each. It's intended to be a quick guide. We're hoping that this launches a series of quick guides on a number of issues, but this is one that I just happen to work with a lot, and so I wrote that, and that should be out in later January is what we're hoping, and we, again, are taking or will be taking pre-orders very soon for that, so stay tuned. The second thing that we're very interested in and very excited about is a men's group that is starting in mid-February, and it's going to cover a number of topics. Um, we're, it's not just going to be an accountability group for pornography or for things like that, but we're talking about how to be a spiritual um, head, how to be a leader. In, in family worship, um, finding fulfillment in our work, avoiding and defeating lust, of course, disciplining children, communicating with our wives, um, even preparing for marriage for those that aren't um, that that aren't married yet. And we want to make this, and, and there's so much more that goes into it. We want to make this something that is a great resource for guys, and we're interested in getting as many as possible. But we're right now looking to see how much support we have. So if you can. We would appreciate if you are interested or if you have a, you know, if, if you're a wife listening to this and your husband might be interested or your son, uh, please reach out to us. Message us on Facebook. Send Jack uh, an email. One of us an email, jack at focuspress.org would be great. Just get a hold of us and let us know, um, yeah, if, if you'd be interested in that. And we're probably going to put 16 and above is what I'm going to say uh, and, and have it has you have to be 16 or older. One of the reasons we're doing this, we talked about this briefly off air, just making sure that we remind everybody why it's so important that we push into these different things. Because one of the comments we've been getting is, where's all the girl stuff? Where's the stuff for women? That stuff is coming. That's in the pipeline. That's something that we are actively working on, hopefully getting more toward the end of 2023 to really start these things. But with the gym podcast, with this porn, get out of porn, and my podcast, and and with this men's group, we are recognizing that the need for the church right now is for men to be men, to step up and, and to be the masculine leaders in their home, in, in their families, of course, in their church and in their communities. And we are here to help build strong men first and foremost um, right now. That's what we see our calling as for the time being. That doesn't mean we're neglecting the women. doesn't mean we're not going to try to put out great content for them coming up soon, but we're initially starting the ball rolling on this. And so we're excited about it. And we want to make sure that we are the strongest men possible. That's what this group is all about. I'll be running it. I do group therapy, so uh, it's it's it'll be hopefully a, uh, a a good group, a fun group for the the gentlemen joining. So we have yet to decide on a time. Probably Thursday nights is what we're looking at. Um, and yeah, that, that's just wanted to give everybody a quick teaser. But please let us know if you're interested. That's the best way that we know if this group is going to work out. Is if we get a lot of interest. We've already got some interest lined up, but. We'd love for, for you to let us know. Fellas, anything else that we need to talk about before we get into the episode? All right, that was a decently long intro, so I apologize. But today's episode, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Jack. You go ahead and get us into it because this is, um, yeah, one that we've kind of, that we've workshopped a little bit together. Jack, go ahead and introduce us. Yeah, we're going to talk about forgotten sins, things that maybe have gone under the radar, things that... Things we might know that are wrong, but that we do, and because they're common, and and we you know we get into this mindset of the big sins, or you know kind of the the ones you really got to work on, kind of in the, uh, you know the, the things that are kind of upfront and very visible versus things that are just really really common and easy to slip into, and and because we all do it, we're not very hard on these things, and so uh, we're gonna look at five forgotten sins and. It's not a New Year's episode, obviously, we're a couple weeks into the year now, but when we are rethinking our spirituality, rethinking where we stand with God and all that, this is one of those things to look at ourselves, and, and we should be in the habit of, and thinking, 
are there things sliding under the radar? I think of uh, in the Psalms, you know, the, the prayer of if there's any wrong way in me, if there's any hidden sin, reveal it to me, show me those things. And as we thought about these forgotten sins, that's the kind of thing that's comes that comes up is that there have sin and and I think we came up with this because all three of us have been this way in that we have you know done sins like this almost daily without thinking about it. And then when you read a verse or you hear a sermon or something, it just hits you like, oh yeah, I'm not supposed to do that. And so uh, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into five things. Um, one that's an obvious one, but we covered it on another episode of, uh, I think it was the Forgotten Commands, was uh, be anxious for nothing. And so that's kind of the example of things that we fall into, but we're not going to get into that one. We've got a list of five here. And so uh, let's just go ahead and get rolling on it. Um, was there something you need to add before we jump in? All right, I'm going to pass it. Uh, we're going to bring Will in a minute. But Joe, I think you've got our first one on our list here. Yeah, it's one that I think is very easy. And I'm going to have to explain this one a little bit. It's deception. You look at it and people go, well, I'm not deceptive. I'm not lying, right? I feel like there's a number of different areas we can take deception. We see this in social media. My life is perfect. My marriage is great. My kids are happy. I'm, I live the perfect life. And to me, that's deceiving. I think when we think about, and we're going to get into this one in the next one as well, but when we think about how we treat others and how we talk to others, it's very easy to be super syrupy sweet man it's it's so great to see you brother and then we turn around and can't stand the guy and to me that's deceptive and i was telling the guys off air about a client that i just had that was really refreshing we had a bit of a scheduling issue and and you know when we got on he's coming out of recovery or he's he's in recovery rather and and coming out of his sex addiction and um he just let me know yeah i was angry about that i just want to be transparent i want to be real with you and just his ability to be real with me let me immediately know where we stood, and it, it worked out great. I validated him, you know, and and it was really refreshing to be on, to be completely transparent and open with one another, and for him to share that emotion with me. I think we live every single day deceiving ourselves, kind of, but also looking to deceive others and just get people to like us and to find the path of least resistance without actually telling people what we really think about them. And then I think we put up a front again on social media and we deceive others in saying, this is who who I really am. And I don't see how that's not deceptive when we show that we have the perfect life and then you know these people in person or whatever it may be and you're going, what? Right? That I don't, I don't think. I thought we were praying for them. They're in another group asking for prayers, but here they're saying their life is perfect. That's deceiving. The social media point is, is such a good one, Joe, and I don't know if you want to flesh that out a little further because, again, such a great point. I want to focus on the kind of real-life react or interactions that we have with each other. Maybe it's, uh, as you mentioned, in the hallway at your congregation, you know, talking to a fellow brother or sister. Maybe you think about how many marriages can be plagued with deception, and what does it all start with? Really, it's a lack of communication. In the example that you just brought up, Joe, what made it – so real for you and what made it you know kind of like wow that's refreshing is that you know they actually communicated how he was feeling towards you rather than just kind of either brushing it aside or maybe the the passive aggressiveness right that usually comes in quite a bit that's exactly right there wasn't any of that it was just straight up communication about hey this is how i feel about it and you know you know let's kind of talk about it again you're you're the therapist of the three but you think about how many problems that that does solve not would solve but does solve in marriages where you know you can either choose communication but where communication is not present deception can creep in and so one of the things that i wanted to bring up too you think about how so many people choose to and for a lot of them it's not blatant deception it's more you know kind of subtle deception and and they do it because they don't think it's going to harm the person right they think oh this is just going to make things easier this is just going to make things you know, not little white lies, right? People do that all the time. And I think that's really what we're getting at is, you know, you have the big blatant, uh, obvious lies, but really what we're talking about is the kind of subtle things that maybe you think you're doing for somebody's own good, or you don't really think it's going to harm them. And what God's word clearly says, and, and I guess the point we're trying to get at is that's just as wrong. That's just as um, evil in the sight of God, because you're, you're doing something or you're saying something that's not true. And so, Jack, I want to pass it back over to you. 
I don't know if you have any other kind of real life examples of this to, to kind of give our listeners maybe a little bit more insight into what we're talking about here. But again, from our experience, this is something that can be so very easy to fall into because you're not viewing it as such a big sin. You're viewing it as minor. As again, it's a, we call it a little white lie, or maybe this is something that, that's that's really not going to harm them. It's for their own good. What are some other examples? It, this is this is one. <laughs> I'm I'm not enjoying this one very much because I'm very bad at it. This is a toe stepper of when you have those moments where that could lead to a confrontation. Our our natural, you know. The fight or flight, fighting's not fun, and you don't want to say something where it's going to hurt somebody, let their feelings, whatever, but we think we're protecting somebody by flattering, by deceiving, by kind of withholding the truth. Well, you, Joe, brought your, you brought up your client. The natural thing for him would have been said, oh, no, it's fine, and right. then to go home and stew on it right. later. Well, if it's not fine, don't say it's fine, but we, we do that because we think, well, and we tell ourselves, well, you know, if, if I were him, you know, well, I didn't want to hurt Joe's feelings. I didn't want to make Joe mad at me. It was about me. It was protecting myself. We we portray it as we're protecting the other person, but no, it's pr- protecting ourselves. And so this, every sin, as Jesus kind of taught us, goes back to either love God with all your heart or love your neighbor as yourself. You're breaking one of those two, if not both, really both. You're always breaking love God with all your heart when you sin. And so love your neighbor as yourself. What I want to hear is what I need to hear, the truth, that even if it hurts, and man, there are, I I pulled it up, I'm not going to do the concordance thing where I read 20 verses to us, go look up flattery in Proverbs in the Psalms, go read, uh, you know, the the, uh, Proverbs uh, 29 verse 5, a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps, you're you're setting a trap, you're hurting somebody by doing that, Um, in Proverbs 27, uh, a few, a couple chapters before, verse 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. And so, you know, if somebody is is just telling you what you want to hear, that's the kiss of an enemy. If somebody hurts your feelings in a way that helps you, they're doing the right thing. And man, again, that self-protective thing just says sidestep the confrontation, sidestep the difficult discussion. And and you just realize that leads to very shallow, dishonest relationships where we end up where we don't like each other that much because you go home and stew on it or, or whatever. Be honest. It's not just the relationship side, though. You think about how much of the New Testament, you know, James, Matthew 18 deals with things like, look, if you if somebody has something against you or you've got something against somebody, are you supposed to just kind of tell them, no, it's fine. You know, don't worry about it. And like you said, just stew over it. No, you're supposed to go to them. You're supposed to resolve it. You're supposed to communicate to them about it, because if you don't, there's souls at stake, right? And I, I know, you know, we might be talking about maybe more minor things, but again, what the New Testament talks about is, look, if you've got something that somebody has done to you that you're upset about, go to them, and then, and then vice versa, of course. And so I think we can get into this whole notion of, well, I, I just kind of going you know, to tell them what they want to hear, and I don't really want to hurt anybody's feelings. We can do that on an individual level. Think about how many, and not to just call people out, but elders and ministers, because they're afraid of confrontation, that's kind of what they're going to do as well, right? Not not really jump headfirst into the confrontation because, man, that's really harsh or, you know, this and that. This is something that we've got to get. <laughs> Jack, you said it was a toe stepper. I would imagine, I don't want to speak for Joe, I can echo the same thing. It's, it's something that's so very easy to fall into, which is why we have it as number one on our list. Um, but, Joe, looked like you had a thought. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned marriage earlier, and we'll move on from this one, move to the next one in a second. But, it's interesting the way you said it, and Jack, you also mentioned, oh, it's fine. How many, yes, I'm really going to step on some toes here, and mine are getting stepped on too, but not in this particular situation, because how many women say, nothing. Well, honey, what's wrong? Nothing. No, it's fine. Is it really? And is that not deceptive? We don't look at it as deceptive. Oh, if he really wanted to know. No, no, no. You're deceiving. You are attempting to tell him, you know, to to brush it off and act like it doesn't matter. It clearly does matter. So what I would say to the, and to your point, Will, about the communication, what I would say to the wives is communicate to your husbands, communicate the hurt. And if you don't feel you can, tell them that. I don't feel that you'll hear me. I don't feel that you'll accept it if I do tell you. But something very much is bothering me. Well, that opens up a new can of worms as well and opens up communication where you can say something about it. But I do think that that's deceptive to just, no, nothing. And then as, as you both mentioned, to stew on it, we have to do a lot better about that. And to come back around before we pass it off and move on, to come back around to the social media one, this gets me. And this is why I don't post on social media, hardly at all. Um, I have a really tough time with the deception that takes place on social media. 
with the, you know, my life is great, the perfect post. Basically the, putting the your best mis- face out there. Yes, misleading people. You know, there's one thing to share. I, You know, Jack's got a, he's got a Facebook account that is, you know, he's got everybody and he's got another Facebook account that is just for friends and family that he doesn't allow. And I love that idea. And on the friends and family, here's pictures of the kids. Man, that's so cool. It's great getting to see. And now I live near him, so it's, it's even better. But it was so cool getting to see them. But it wasn't bragging. Look at my life. It's like, man, it's great to see them. But it was a very specific thing where he has a, a select group of people that could see it. I thought that's the best the best way that it could be done. It's not a braggadocious look at me, look at my life. And a lot of people use social media as that where they're attempting to spin a narrative about themselves. And I think if we're really going to check our hearts and really ask ourselves, there's an air of deception of we want to project something that we're not. We want to show people a side of us that we would like them to see, and that literally is flattery and deception. That really is what it is, in my opinion. Um, and it's sidestepping the the nitty gritty of like maybe life isn't as good right now. Well, why don't you go tell somebody that in real life instead of getting on social media and telling me how great life is? I have a problem with that. I don't know, it, fellas. Am I off on that? Am I a little too harsh? Am I missing the point? Because I'm not on social media all that much. Am I missing the point of that? No, or does I that, think do you see that too. I think that feeds into the second one on our list here really well, actually. Absolutely. And Absolutely. the second one is is coveting, is greed, is envy, is looking at somebody else's life and saying, I want that, I'm upset that I don't have that. And I mean, that's really the thing is what well, they always say, people put their highlight reel on social media. And so you look and man, you know, this such and such friend, they're, they're traveling the world, they're going out and eating at fancy restaurants, they're having a big old time, their kids are always, you know, in nice clothes they haven't been out playing in the mud and got you know their hair all combed and all that and i look at my kids and it's like what what disaster awaits today you know kind of thing and so you look at that and you get upset or or i think it was a few years ago this report came out that i think a third of all divorces mentioned facebook or or social media like in the filing wow and and i mean it's that it's looking and going well you know that guy's wife you know looks like she cooks and cleans better than my wife or that guy is or that lady's husband you know boy he's he's such a good dad good good husband he's really there for her and i don't have that and so it it they're projecting their highlight reel you don't see their bad side and so from our side of the you know when when you're on the other side of the table you look and go i want what they have my life is not good enough it fosters an attitude of discontentment is what it is exactly. it, it creates discon it creates discontentment and but the question that i have that i want to ask you guys is you know, because I, I, again, this is one that I've been guilty of before, too, looking at, man, they're at the beach again. This is the fourth time this year. Man, that must be nice, you know, to go to the beach that much and that type of thing. And so I guess my question is, where where's the line between, man, that's really, that's that's nice. I would like to go to the beach, you know, as often as they as they do. And then where does it get into covetousness and, and, and greed? If that, does that make sense? Like, I feel like there is a difference between, man, I would really, man. I'd really like to have that life or I'd like to have that much free time or whatever it is. You fill in the blank, that car, whatever it is. Where does it cross the line from that into the sin of covetousness or the, or the sin of greed? You know what I mean? Um, obviously, if, if you're wanting a, a different family or something like that, that's never okay. But I think if, if you're looking at somebody's, again, free time or you're looking at somebody's house, car, fill in the blank, whatever it is, I feel like there is a level to it where it is, you know, just look you're looking at it saying damn that'd be really nice to have and then there's a level that again fosters the discontentment what's the line what, what do you guys have to say to that i i would have i could be off on this this is my take jack i'm interested to hear yours but real fast i would say two things first off the amount of time you spend on it i think when it really gets into the heart it's less of a fleeting sure. thought it's the same thing as what's the line of lust sure uh, i mean it's different for each person but all i know is when it it stops being one one glance of oh wow that's you know, that's pretty. And it starts being, I, I really want that. Now I can appreciate beauty, you know, but at some point it becomes less. And it's when I start lingering in my opinion. And I think that's very much the case here. When you start lingering on what that other person has and on what you don't have, where you feel yourself get discontent. So the length of time you spend on it. And the second part or piece of that, I would say would be the emotions surrounding it. When I start getting frustrated at the other person, when I start noticing that, you know, again, I'm I'm grumbling a little more. I'm a little more. I'm just bitter. I'm just angry about what I don't because I'm have having and to what work and have. I'm out at the beach or something. Exactly. Yeah. And and when the emotions start to really creep toward negativity and toward anger, 
I think that also is where it's in. If I go, wow, good for them. Boy, that'd be nice. I wish I was at the beach. That'd be a lot of fun. All right, back to work. That's perfectly fine. If a week later I'm going, those people always go to the beach. I can't believe that they, you know, they went to the beach again. Are you serious? Where do they even get the money for this? What, don't they ever work? Like, clearly, I think we've we've crossed into, you know, crossed the line on that due to the emotions and the length of time present. I don't know. That's my take on it. Jack, how about you? Yeah, you brought up the word contentment, Will. And if if you're at the point where you're not content with what you have, no, that doesn't mean looking at something going, you know, that that would be nice to have, or maybe that that's a goal for someday to try and get to such and such thing uh, without being overly materialistic, but just, you know, that's it's okay to have nice things or take a vacation with your family or whatever. Um, so I think you're hitting on something, Joe, there. Of if you can't be happy for the other person and rejoice with those who rejoice, that's not a good sign. Um, the other, we mentioned contentment, and, well, a couple verses on that. In First Timothy 6, when he's talking about the love of money, he says, if we have food and clothing, with, uh, we will be content with these. Will we? <laughs> I mean, like, and you think about that, that's pointing directly back to Jesus in Matthew 6, of God clothes the lilies of the field, he feeds the sparrows, he's, he's watching out for you, you're going to have those things. Don't worry about the rest of it. And so food and clothing really are the promises we have from God. And so... And if if we have that, and I as Americans, I mean, we almost all do every day, food and clothing, we got a roof over our head, you know, and the luxuries that we do enjoy in varying degrees. And if we can't be content with that, and it's got to be the next thing, it's got to be the next thing, well, then you, it's not just a lack of contentment, it's ingratitude. It's not giving thanks for what I have, because, you know, it, it's like the kid that opens a pile of 30 Christmas presents and goes, where's the, where's the next one? Like, that's it? I, you know, like... Be thankful for what you have, okay? And and so, but this is another thing that social media induces in us is a reminder of what we don't have. I posted on this recently. Uh, my friend Daniel uh, that I do the Who Let the Dogma podcast out with, Daniel Mayfield, he got an espresso maker. He and I really like quality, high-quality coffee. I'm really happy for him. It's really neat. He posts, you know, some of his lattes or whatever. And so I was like, you know what? I, I, exactly what Will's talking about. I would like an espresso maker. So I looked it up Black <laughs> Friday. I was like, what do they run? And, you know, Daniel, he had saved a while for his, and he got his. Well, now I'm just starting out. I'm like, that that's kind of expensive, but I'll save. You know, it'll take me a while, but eventually I'll get there. Facebook being what they are for the last month and a half has given me espresso ads every day. I can't scroll past three posts without, hey, here's this espresso maker. Here's this one. This one's on sale. This one's on this on sale. And it's this reminder, you don't have an espresso maker. And as I sit here and drink my sad cup of brew coffee, you know, dr- drip brew, like, <laughs> I don't have an espresso maker. It. So what? You know what? I've got coffee. I've got good coffee. I've got nice stuff. I, I mean, like, but it, it's everything about this world is to generate discontentment in us. And so we have to be so cautious about that. As we said, like the worst thing with another pe- person's family, wish I had their kids, wish I had their spouse, wish I had whatever, but then their possessions or, or their, their situation in life, their money, whatever status. it is. Yeah, yeah, status. I mean, there's just a million different things where you can – preachers, we can do that really badly. Man, a lot of people like that guy's post. A lot of people shared his, his article or his sermon or whatever else like – you know, like it's not a competition. And you think about Paul in Philippians one, where he talks about some people are preaching out of selfish ambition. So what? People are hearing about Jesus, it's okay. And so, like, we've got mm-hmm. to get in this mindset right. of what what really matters here. Yeah, the only other thing that I would say, and this is kind of stating the obvious, but I think there's definitely a correlation with how much time you do spend on social media and also your level of discontentment. Basically, the more time that you're spending looking at other people's photos and, and, you know, again, just kind of being so heavily invested in what other people are posting, odds are your discontentment level is going to go up quite a bit. And so that would be something to consider as a listener is, man, how, you know, we've had social media episodes before. How much time are you, are you spending, you know, on social media? How much time are you spending looking, gazing, wishing that, you know, that you had, again, this other lifestyle or this other, all this free time or, or whatever it is? Unless we got anything else, Joe, well, you yeah, got something before? Yeah, we, just yeah. real fast, Jack, you hit on a very important point because what, it strikes me that, well, we didn't really say what to do to avoid it. Um, and But, Jack, you kind of did, which is gratefulness. I was keeping a thankfulness right. journal there for the most, for, for the first over half of last year, and I stopped. And I, that's something I very much want to get back into because I think gratefulness, it's not just social media. You walk outside your door, you, you drive down the road, oh, there's there goes one of those new Mustangs, you know, or there goes one of those new... Um, you know, whatever else. Oh, look at that guy's house. That's gorgeous. Wow, what a house, right? I have to go in the, I have to go into West Nashville from time to time. My goodness. There's some really, <laughs> really nice houses. 
And, uh, and the worst thing is on my way to Nashville school of preaching, the route that I take is like, Oh wow. That's a nice house. Oh boy. What a, what a manicured lawn. And so I'm about to go teach the word of God and here are all my thoughts on what I don't have. So it's not just social media. We have to guard against it. And I think gratefulness does it. If you wake up every day and you're thankful for something, I think it's, I'm just grateful for what I have. And there's that old, you know, that old saying of like, or question of if you only had what you thanked God for yesterday, how much would you have? Boy, that hits me right between the eyes. Like, goodness. That, I think, guards against discontentment and guards against this coveting uh, somebody else's stuff. So, no, I think I think that's that'll wrap it up. Will, I want to pass the third one over to you. So, as we're going, we see the first forgotten sin, I think, is deception. It's very easy to allow that and not recognize. The second is this coveting, this greed of wanting something else, wanting somebody else's life, not recognizing it. We got to do better on that, I think, um, and just be more cognizant. Will, get us into the third. Sure. So the third one is, this one frustrates me quite a bit because I think all of us, we know what the word means, but in our minds, it's something that's, oh, this, you know, we, in our minds, it's categorized as one thing. And then when we are guilty of it or we fall victim to it, we say, oh, it's not, it's not quite that bad. And the third one's gossip. And so when I say that, what I'm saying is I think so many people can be guilty of gossip, but in their minds, gossip is one thing. And then when they are guilty of gossip, they're like, oh, well, th- this is not gossip, right? This is something else. This isn't near as bad as gossip. And so, you know, gossip is one of those things that can, again, it's difficult to, to it's difficult for people to kind of categorize in their mind, but I would encourage you look up a simple definition of the word gossip. It's not a hard word to define. It, it's very easy to define idle talk or rumor, especially about the personal or private affairs of others. Uh, Oxford adds that it typically involves details that are not confirmed as being true. We know what gossip is. It's talking about people behind their back and especially about things that you may or may not know to be true. And I want to speak to, I'm going to bring up several places in scripture here in just a second, but I want to speak to why, why is gossip such a temptation, right? You know, common sense says, well, just don't talk about people, right? Just, just keep it to yourself. I think one of the reasons gossip is so tempting is because it, it it can be kind of fun to talk to other people about other people. For one reason, it makes you feel better. It gives you a, a, a you know cool topic of conversation. It it's something that again people enjoy to do for some reason. And I don't want to be accused of, of being sexist or or anything like this. But who is typically or what is the typical gender that is more guilty of this? Typically, it's women. Um, not that men can't be. But when we're talking about gossip, God's word makes it very clear this is something that a follower of Christ has no business being involved in. And yet again, I think so many Christians are. I think so many Christians can be guilty of this because, again, in our minds, it's like, oh, I'm not gossiping. This is just, you know, we're just having a conversation about X, Y, and Z. And it's like, no, look up the definition of gossip. Look up the scripture that I'm about to point out. That's gossip. It's what it is. Um, I think we've forgotten that in Proverbs 6 and in the list of the things that the Lord hates, what is one of the things that he mentions? One who sows discord among brethren. Uh, James chapter 1, I was teaching on James 1 uh, there for a while, a couple weeks ago. And James, he's telling he's telling his his readers, his listeners, look, you got to be a doer of the word. There are certain th- specific things that you have to do. And right after that, one of the things he brings up is bridling your tongue. He says, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. James 1, 26. James is basically saying, look, you can't claim to be religious. You can't claim to be a Christian if you're going to have no filter on your tongue, if you're going to have no ability to rein in your tongue, the things that you say. And so, guys, I want to open it up to you. But this one, again, it frustrates me because I think so many Christians can be guilty of this, but they categorize it as something else in their minds. And, and again, they say, oh, this isn't gossip. This is something else. But I personally have seen so much, I don't know if damage is the right word, but again, just discord that has been sown because people, again, they don't bridle their tongue. There's no self-discipline with the things that they say, and they fall guilty to this forgotten sin. But what do you guys have to, to kind of add to that little rant there? Yeah, uh, it's it's very, like you said, very easy to do. Uh, you know, I've seen people say, and this is true, I, I've seen it, you guys probably have too, that it's very easy to disguise gossip as a prayer request. Oh, you know, so-and-so, they're just dealing, like, you know, there, there's just a lot of ways in which we can, Bring up negative issue, or, you know, uh, negative. I don't know feelings about somebody else, negative problems that were just issues that we have with the person, um, and share it with other people behind their back. But this is something I found is 
pretty well universally true. All the things that say, man, if you talk with people uh, and they're they're always talking about somebody else behind their back and running them down, guess what happens when you leave the room? You become the subject. That happens. Right. I mean, like I, I've been subject to that. I, you know, and and I've participated in gossip and things I'm I'm not proud of, and that's just something that's so easy to do. And as you said, there's this fine line between caring about somebody, wanting to help somebody. There's an issue with somebody, and and so like at a certain point, you have to talk about them with somebody else and figure out how do we solve this problem, but. That doesn't mean that every time you do that, that's what you're doing. Uh, because if it just stays as a vent session, is boy, this person's terrible. We all can't stand them. The end. Let's move on. That doesn't do anybody any good. If you're not, uh, and, and I, I think I will put it to you guys what you think the difference is between having that discussion and it being gossip. I think the difference is goes back to our deception point. Are you willing to talk to the person about it? You know, if you're talking to somebody else and saying, how should I approach this? How should I reconcile with them? How should I address this problem that I have with them? That's one thing. If you're just saying, man, can you believe that thing they did? Boy, that's horrible. Oh, my goodness. That person, they're the worst. It, like, Okay, that that's not constructive toward them at all. In fact, that's just tearing them down in your eyes and everybody else's eyes. And everybody leaves the room thinking worse of them. We shouldn't want that for each other. And, and again, that's a golden rule, do unto others kind of thing. So... What do you guys see as the dividing line? Well, I was actually going to—I was, I was going to cut you off and ask you guys that. Uh, this is the problem. This is the really difficult thing of, no, but that's not gossip. It's not gossip. Well, okay, well, what is gossip? I don't know, but that's not gossip. Like, it's really important for us as Christians to define what gossip is because I can tell you it is incredibly detrimental to sit around with a non-Christian and to talk about another Christian in that way and for them to see a Christian doing that. Right, it's very detrimental um, to the faith to to run each other down like that. And we don't we see Paul clearly talk about other people's sins, the man in First Corinthians five. But that was sin that was already out in the open. That was something that everybody already knew about. And he says, "You guys all know that he's sleeping with his father's wife. Go do something about it." Right? You're not loving for accepting him. You need to disfellowship him. We don't see Paul outing people. I don't think too much on the running somebody down. Uh, we we don't see any of that. But And I was trying to think through everything that I was aware of in, in Scripture of it's always addressed to a specific person. The prophets went to the kings or went to the people and said, hey, you're doing this wrong. They didn't just speak about them. They spoke to them. And I think if we were, I think, Jackie, you hit it on the head, if we're willing to speak to them and not just about them, that's that's the key. Um, and you well, say, and, well, and for what purpose is what is what I would add. Again, I think a lot of people do it. For, do it for sport like oh let's i gotta think of something to say let's talk about this you know as opposed to this is an issue let's let me let me uh, maybe it's an advice thing or, or how can we solve this problem for a lot of people it's just a way to kill time you now, know what here's I mean? my here's my struggle though we grew up look my family is very critical um still something we struggle with and, and try to work on uh, we can be very critical of people however i will say there was no it was i'll say this it was incredibly helpful it was very helpful to be able to look at somebody's life and say, do you see the fruits of what's going on here? I don't know what gets into gossip there. Now, it, I don't, maybe it was gossip, but I do look at, that was very helpful for us to look at the fruits of somebody's life and to say, they chose this path and now they're dealing with this consequence. Um, Are you no, talking about from a parent to child relationship? Yeah, parent to child. I mean, it was, it was sibling to sibling. Um, we were able to kind of, look at somebody else's life and see that their choices did that. Now, was I gossiping about that person by saying, that's where it got him. I'm not going to them. I don't have any intention to go to them. It was more of just learning from their life, negative or positive. Um, unfortunately, probably more than negative due to the critical nature of it. But it also made us very aware of and very discerning of what is right and what is wrong and the consequences of what is right and what is wrong. I struggle with that one. That's, that's where I, you know, get into, okay, can I have a conversation about someone and about some of their choices and say, this is wrong and this is the, the consequences of it without feeling the need to go to them? And maybe this is all nuanced and maybe that's exactly what you're speaking to, but I kind of feel like there is a bit of a difference in that. But what are your guys' thoughts on that? The only the only thing I would say to that is I do think there is something to the, the definition that I read where if something is a rumor or might not be true, that's when there's there should be some caution tape up there going okay maybe I don't need to be spreading this if if somebody has committed 
and, and maybe Joe, I know you might not have been talking about blatant sins, but if somebody is living their life in a certain way that, for instance, your parents took you and said, here, let's, let's talk about this. Let's learn from this. I, I would not categorize that as gossip because that's, that's the way somebody's living their life. It's out in public. It's something that's very easy to see. I think parents should be, you know, teaching their kids about, you know, hey, look at this really good example or look at this really bad example. I, I, I certainly would not categorize that as gossip. I think where, again, where the caution tape needs to come up is, is this something that is, you know, a rumor? Is this something that's, that's you know, might not be true? And I just kind of want to, you know, put the feelers out there and talk to – and whoever it is, talk to whoever it is about it and kind of get their thoughts on it. That's where I think you really got to slow down and say, okay, hold on, what's the purpose of this? You know, if, if you're a parent wanting to teach your kid about, you know, the value of living a life a certain way, I would hope that you would make sure and, and wait until the information becomes public or, you know, something along those lines. Does that make sense? You see that the yeah. difference that I'm going for I here? just think it can be very uh, – it could slip in very easily. A educational sure. An educational uh, moment, quote-unquote, can very quickly turn into gossip. And I think it did with us um, enough that, that I'm wary of it, but at the same time, I'm not altogether against it, I don't think. I think that's I think you're right on that, Jack. One of the things you hear with this discussion sometimes is would you say it to their face? Uh and and you don't always have the opportunity to do so, but man, I think we've all been in those situations where it kind of becomes clear that somebody's had something said about their back and or behind their back and then when the person has the chance to be confronted on it, you know, like, hey, I heard you saying Oh, no, no. And that goes to the deception thing. No, there's no problem between me and you. Like, come on. I mean, like, and that that just feels awful as the person who was spoken about. Like, so you'll tell somebody else, but you won't tell me. Which, again, goes to that you don't care about me. You just want to tear me down. And so, I mean, it can be as simple as something as, you know, we're watching the football game and an athlete does something obnoxious, something, you know, a dirty play or whatever. And, you know, if your dad turns to you and says, no, don't, I, I better not see you doing that kind of thing. Okay, that he's not gossiping about that guy because I think if if given the opportunity, if he was his coach, he would say that's not cool, that's not okay. Uh, you know, it's like you don't always have the opportunity to have the conversation with the person who maybe is a bad example. But it really is the thing of like if you wouldn't say it in front of them, if you don't have the guts to criticize or or point out or or you know make an example of them to themselves, you better hold it. You better not tell somebody else. And so I, I think that's a pretty good standard in itself. That doesn't gloss over everything. That doesn't, it's not a pass for everything. But you really do have to think about, do I care about this person? Or am I just tearing them down for my own gain? For my own feeling better about myself? Measuring myself up against somebody else? And so I bring them down? I mean, there's a lot of bad motivations that lead to this kind of thing. Um, anything else on gossip from you guys before we move on? All right. Uh, I think that brings it back to me. Um... This is another one. These these all are, are very related in a lot of ways. Um, bitterness and grumbling. Um, just, I really think that is, and I wrote an article about this over Thanksgiving. It was kind of my Thanksgiving article. It's up on focuspress.org still. I call it the sign of a Christian who doesn't get it. And that's bitterness. I mean, it's it's the grumbling. It's the always complaining. Is Life is so negative. And this is one of those things that we fall into without really thinking about it. Oh, it's a Monday again. Oh, I got to go to work. Oh, I've got, you know, oh, my kids. Oh, you know, my, my, the old ball and chain. All, all these phrases we use of like, life is a drag. Life is horrible. Life is, you know, just, just a constant burden on us. Where's the gratitude? Where's the happiness? Where's the, the joy of the Christian life that comes out in that? And man, you just think back to Israel wandering in the wilderness. God just parted the Red Sea and we walked through on dry ground. Nobody's ever seen this before. Our enemies all just died. We just had a big old party and celebrated. And then the next day we look up and go, where's the bread? Oh, great. We're all going to die. Where's the bread? Where's the, like, and we look at them and go, what are you doing? And then they get the bread and it's like, okay, I'm sick of bread. What's next? Well, yeah. <laughs> or, hey, okay, great. Bread. Where's the water? Where's the water? We're going to die. Well, let's go back to Egypt. You know, like just every day it was a new thing and you can go, man, those guys sure were ungrateful, and then you kind of look at our own lives, and it's like, boy, uh, I, I, they're not the only ones, are they? And so, bitterness, grumbling, I mean, there are so many verses on putting this far from you, and it goes also to the gratitude thing, of if you're living a life of gratitude, and you're giving thanks to God every day for what you have, you're not going to be a bitter, grumbling person. I mean, like, if you have Christ, if you have the forgiveness of your sins, and even if life here is horrible, you're in constant pain every day, whatever the case is, but you're like, you know what? Someday I'm going to be out of here and I'm going to be with him for all of eternity. 
that's plenty to be grateful for. That's there's plenty to be joyful for, and that's why joy is one of the fruit of the is in that list of the fruit of the spirit, right? Joy is a natural result of walking with God, and if we don't have that, if we have that bitterness and grumbling, there's a problem. Well, it causes we devoted question, a full... are we walking with God? Sorry, well, go for it. So yeah, I was just gonna say we devoted a full episode to finding joy in the Christian life. I think it was one of the earlier episodes we did last year. But one of the things that we brought up and, and something that I think is always important to bring up whenever, you know, topics about bitterness and grumbling come up is you got to consider what kind of advertisement are you being for the church? What kind of advertisement are you being for being a Christian in general? Jack, I think you were kind of hitting on that is that, look, if the world, if somebody who is outside of Christ looks at you, looks at your family, looks at the way you carry yourself, the phrases, all those things that, that you already hit on and says, man, their life's that bad, man, sure don't want any part of that. Glad I'm not. Glad I don't go to that church. Glad I'm not a part of that faith, that religion. You've got to consider, and it, again, it doesn't mean that you put on a fake smile everywhere you go, but something that you need to ask yourself is, why do I have this mindset? Why is this my perspective? Why am I always looking at things from the pessimistic side? And why am, why am I always grumbling or, or doing things bitterly? As we pointed out in that episode that I just referenced, we have Christ. We have, etern- we have eternity. We have salvation. We have everything that we need to go through life with nothing but a positive outlook. Doesn't mean we're going to have bad or that we're not going to have bad days. Of course not. Doesn't mean we're not going to have stressful times in our life. Of course not. But what it means is that when we wake up each day, whether it be on a Monday or whether it be on a Saturday, we go, we, we, we tackle the day we go through life with the same base foundation of joy. And that is the fact that we have hope of eternal life, that the world doesn't have that. And so again, if, if, if somebody looks at you as a Christian and somebody looks at somebody who's not a Christian and they don't really see a difference, what is, what is going to be the, the advantage in their mind to being a Christian? That should be something that, that separates, that's a differentiator between somebody who is a Christian and somebody who's not, is a joy that emanates from, from everything that they do. And we have so many, and again, I'm going to kind of call out the older generation here, we have so many people, specifically in the older generation within our churches, who just exude this bitterness that Jack is talking about that exude this kind of grumbling and got to have things my way. And man, life is just so hard. That's something that is not, you know, emblematic of a follower of Christ. And so if that's, if you're listening to this going, man, that's kind of hitting a little close to home. That kind of sounds like something I do. We would encourage you make a change to that, but, but maybe start with asking yourself, why do you have that attitude? Limitations three talks about God's mercies being new every morning, right? Great is his faithfulness. That's in the midst of a very depressing book, Lamentations. He's lamenting. Jeremiah is in a very difficult time, but he still has it in himself. Right after basically saying that he felt um, rejected by God to say, you know what? God is good. Every single morning I wake up, I see God is good. And I spoke on this on my Get Out of Porn podcast, the importance for addicts in, in chasing sobriety to have a really solid morning routine. And I would say the same thing for those struggling with bitterness, which mainly is all of us. The morning is so important. And if you wake up and you can read that read that verse and see that his mercies is, you know, are new every morning, focusing on that, focusing on I've been saved. I am I am a child of God's. I have been forgiven of all my sins today and I get to go out and I get to to live a life that is meaningful, that has purpose, and I get to tell other people about that God. Like, almost a pep talk to yourself every morning. I think there's a lot of value in getting the morning right. Win the morning, as you'll hear some people say. you got to win those moments where you start off grateful. You start off thinking about all the things that you do have. It goes with the uh, coveting. But with the bitterness, the other thing that I would say, just from a therapy perspective, is if you find that you are a very bitter person, Most of the time, the bitterness, you say, well, I just, you know, there's these little things that cause bitterness throughout the day. I always illustrate it by a a water bottle. If your water bottle is completely filled and you have about two centimeters at the top, how much does it take before it starts spilling out? Not very much. It It takes a couple drops and starts spilling out. You go, wow, those couple drops must have been a big deal. No, those couple drops weren't a big deal at all. You have that much unprocessed bitterness and anger and frustration underneath you need to give that over to God and you need to process through all of the anger and the bitterness that is driving you toward being a bitter person, being a person who cannot find the the good in life. If you're prone toward finding all the negativity, um, you need to ask yourself why. It's not enough just as a Christian to go, okay, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Why are you doing what you're doing? 
No, not everything is a trauma response, but chances are you probably have something that happened in the past that you really haven't given over to God, that you really haven't processed through, and you're allowing that to affect every single part of you. Bitterness has a physical, a, a truly, not just emotional, not just intellectual, not just a spiritual, obviously it affects all those. It has a physical effect on the body. When you carry bitterness around, your body deteriorates faster. These are There are scientific studies that show that. This is horrible for you in every single way, and there's a reason God tells us and why Paul tells us, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. You win the morning, you set your mind on all the things that are worthy of rejoicing over. Man, it's powerful. It's powerful. It's such good stuff. But you waking up and going, another day, got to get out of bed. You've already lost the day. You've already made up your mind that day is going to stink. The spiritual side of it, you mentioned the, the physical effects. The spiritual side of it is really big as well. And it's, it just leaves you that much closer to being pushed away from God. It leaves you that much closer to a bad thing happens and you blame God. Because if you don't think that God is good, taste and see that the Lord is good, as the psalmist had said. Well, if you're not getting that, then you know anything bad happens, you're going to be mad at him. You're going to be upset. Your, your faith is shaken. And I think a big factor in this is Romans 1. We always talk about Romans 1 in the sense of the degeneracy of you know men going after men, women going after women, and people giving hearty approval to that which God calls evil. And yeah, that's the end result of the spiral. You know where the spiral starts? They knew God, but they wouldn't honor him or give him thanks as such. If you're not giving God thanks, if you're not looking to him and, and saying, you know what, God's a good God, I'm going to be thankful to him, I'm going to offer the sacrifices of praise and, and all of that stuff, that starts leading you down that path away from God, and God gives you over to those things. And so I would say that one last thing, and this is a very practical thing I've learned in the last couple of years. As a person who's prone towards pessimism, negativity, critical spirit, things like that, things that I have to work on, look at how you talk to yourself in your own brain or talk about yourself. You know, and this is something I do a lot, and I, I don't as much anymore, but I would. And I didn't even think that much of it until you really start paying attention to how it affects you. You know, I'd mess something up or, you know, I would misschedule something or forget that I was supposed to do something and say, oh, man, I'm an idiot. Just jokingly. Like, I, oh, you know, do you really think you're an idiot? Well, no, but stop talking to yourself that way. Stop thinking in that way. Because you think of yourself that way, you're going to think of others that way. You're going to look at the world that way with this, this negative, critical, oh, that's worthless, that's terrible, that's... No, just, okay, well, that thing, I messed that thing up. On to the next thing, big deal. No, you know, no worries, okay? And so get that bitterness, that negativity, that complaint, that that criticism, the just the pessimistic view of life. Nobody wants to be around that guy. Nobody wants to be that guy. Don't be that guy. And, and it's something, again, the joy of knowing God should push that kind of attitude out of our lives. All right, we've got one more before we get out of here. Uh, I think, Joe, you've got the lead on this, this final one. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that is laziness just to come right out with it laziness i think this is a it's an obvious one i think anybody who was putting a list together would probably have laziness on there it's very easy um to view it as oh yep that's a sin that's a struggle yeah it is and it's a sin and a struggle in a ways in a lot of ways we don't know this is manifested in a number of ways this is manifested in the wife the stay-at-home wife who cannot keep a clean house this is manifested in the guy who goes to work and spends all his time on Twitter. This is manifested in, you know, you having an opportunity to take care of your house on the weekend and you decide that you're going to stay inside and play Call of Duty all day uh, because, well, this is the one time that I get to myself. Could I go and improve the house? Could I go and plant a garden? Could I go and do those things? Yeah, but, you know, I just need some me time. And that me time turns into me time weekend after weekend after weekend and the nights well i could be helping my wife out here but i'm not going to and the wives they're around during the day well you know it's difficult to kids i realize it's difficult to kids but if you're going to be a stay-at-home wife there are duties that come along with that i think this happens a lot and i've heard it a lot and of, of these guys that grow very frustrated with their wives because their wives aren't you know they come home and it's like well i worked my eight hour day i worked my nine ten hour day come home the house is in the same state what happened well, you know, just got busy. They're doing what? Your job is to keep house. A, a woman who is a keeper at home, you know, or keeper of the home, that's part of the job. I think that speaks to the laziness of our culture. It's easy to waste all your time on social media the same way that the guy who gets on and wastes half of his day at, at work perusing TikTok and, and Twitter and Facebook and YouTube shorts 
and all of that. That's laziness, and we can let it creep in way easier than we want to. I I'm, I was one of the worst at this. I, I mean, I had to buy a lifetime subscription to an app called Freedom so I could shut off YouTube, and I could shut off Twitter during the day. I could shut off those apps that just drain your time because I would find myself doing this. It's an escape, and we, we couch it as such. Man, I've been working really hard, and I just need a quick escape. And that quick escape for, goes from 15 minutes to 30 minutes to an hour to two hours. Oh, man, I really got to get back to work. No. And then if we work really hard, then we come home and we kick up our feet. And this is where we start seeing laziness within our own families is, well, now I'm too lazy to discipline the kids. My wife has had them all day. You know, come home. I could play with the kids. I could help out with some things, you know, help cook dinner or help, help with her. Maybe she's really worked hard. Um, but, you know, it's been a long day. Or once again with the wife, I don't, I don't want to get on people too hard or, or beat a dead horse. I just think it creeps into so many aspects of life that we don't even begin to see. And we see it through video games and we see it through social media and we see it through Netflix and, you know, the TV that we watch. And, and it's not bad to watch those things. I'm not saying it's bad to get on social media. I'm not saying it's bad to play video games. But at what point do those things become a vice? And at what point do those things push us into laziness? Right. We... We enjoy comfort. We enjoy kind of turning our brain off. And so any opportunity that we get, typically people will take that. And But again, the problem is this is another one of those where you have to ask the question, where's the line? You know, once again, I don't think anybody would say, you know, if you take an hour of your day and, and turn on the TV at night, that that's wrong. Or take a, you know, an hour and look at social media, that's wrong. I think we all know it gets wrong or there's a, there's a point where it becomes wrong, but what is that point? And I think that is one of those things because again, it is going to be subjective. You do have to ask yourself, what am I running away from and what am I choosing to do with my time as far as productivity? Obviously, if you're somebody who is, you are paid for eight, nine hours of work a day for, for X, Y, Z, and you're burning that on social media, that's wrong. You're stealing from your employer. Um, if that's the case, I think to Joe's point about somebody, about a wife who is, her purpose is to take care of the home. If you're neglecting that for the sake of Netflix and, and Facebook, then that's wrong. Um, but again, I guess I'll ask the question that is difficult to answer once again. What is the line here? Uh, because again, there there is there's nothing wrong with with taking some time to enjoy yourself. To uh, my dad would would call it vegging out. You know, again, kind of turn your brain off. You sit in front of a football game or whatever it is. There is a point in when it becomes just pure laziness. You're not being productive with your family. You're not being productive with uh, with God and taking care of your spiritual life. But what is that point? That's the tough one. I think it's one of those things deep down. We all know what it is. You know, we all get the the feeling of man. I've, I've been doing this for too long, but we revel in it. We stay in that. But I'll, I'll ask you guys, for you personally, because maybe that's the only way we can answer this. Is there's nothing really objective? What is that line? I think it's a matter of discipline. Uh, if you are disciplined and you plan rest into your life, plan a vacation, plan, you know, time, we just had time off for the holidays or whatever, plan, you know, on, on a Saturday, I'm going to do some house chores in the morning and then I'm going to just enjoy the time with my kids or, or whatever. If I have that discipline into my life in which I have created time for rest, then there's nothing wrong with that rest. If, on the other hand, when I'm supposed to be working, supposed to be taking care of something around the house, supposed to be engaged in something and I'm not because I'm being lazy that's a problem that's that's undisciplined rest and that's not something that you've earned that's not something you've set aside and that's what gets away from you that's where as Joe's talking about and I, I mean I, we've probably all been there those of us who have office desk jobs whatever where you look down and oops an hour just went by and I didn't get anything done you know like it, it's in this day and age, that is really hard to avoid. Well, discipline, and like you said, it's something like a freedom app or whatever, builds that discipline in where it's like, I can't even if I want to, I better get to work. And then, you know, you've got it where it turns back on at night where you've given yourself, okay, I can get 20 minutes on Facebook and just check in and, you know, keep on things. It's the the scrolling thing. And man, you an app like that that controls your time, the, the screen time counters that show you how much you've been on your phone, those things hurt, man. Like... Those, you need those things because it shows you how disciplined you're being. And so if you set goals for yourself, you set time aside for yourself, you say, this day of the week is for just hanging out and having a good time or, or this time at night after dinner with my kids, you know, we're going to get our chores done and, and sit down. Wh whatever it is, set that time aside. And if you're disciplined in creating that time, you can enjoy it. But you know something I've felt, and I think you guys would agree with this, when I've got a whole pile of work that I didn't get done, 
but then we come to Friday night and you know it's the it's the weekend and I've got Saturday and I just left a bunch of work left over that that's not done and I have to pick it up on Monday. I don't enjoy that rest. It's not restful because it's all in the back of my head like man, Monday is going to be so bad. Monday is going to hurt so much because I've got so much work to do. So it's the discipline that creates the rest for yourself. And I think the other side of this, and Joe, you kind of hinted at this as well. The times where I'm the worst husband and father are when I'm not on top of my game. When I'm not diligent enough to stay after the kids, and if I told them to go clean up their toys, then I'm not, like, checking in on them. They're little. They they get distracted really easy. And so I want to be lazy and go sit on my phone and just expect them to get it done. No, I've got to be hands-on with that. Same, you know, with my wife. If I'm not doing my work and I'm not doing my chores around the house or whatever, it's a lot easier to get mad at her because I'm really vicariously blaming myself through her and, and taking my frustration with myself out on her. Laziness just makes life bad for everybody. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of your goals idea. I think if you set a goal for the week, and I'm I do this myself, is I have a checkbox checklist. Man, they work so well because you get a little dopamine hit every single time you check something off the list. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, here we go. That's you get so a lot true. done. Yeah. And it may be the dumbest thing. Go to the dry cleaners. Oh buddy, I did it. My I favorite is it. when you did done. something already, but you add it to the list so you can check the box. You know, yep, so like, yeah, done that one. <laughs> you know, I, I need the the hit from that, so I've got to write it down even though it's already done. I do that every single week pretty much Why so not? I, but i also yeah i got that done because it's also a good like man look at all i got done you so put the I, most minor of things on there J- drive to work check yeah exactly <laughs> wake up wake, wake up in the morning <laughs> <laughs> check out. all right start the day with a check, check mark man. all yeah. right um <laughs> yeah drink your coffee all right boy i missed that one no um but having goals where you can say okay i accomplished a lot of my list have i ever accomplished my entire to-do list in a week Probably not, to be quite honest with you. However, I do put like 30 things on the list, some of which are a lot, and I know it's a lot. Finish a book this week. like <laughs> Probably not. Um, I was too busy getting the other 29 things done. But I can look back and go, I earned that. I earned that rest. And you know, God rested on the seventh day. And we look at that. Did God stop working completely? Did he have any other work? Well, yeah, he's been working in our lives for the last 6,000 years. So... Yeah, I would say God still had work to do after the six days of creation. But he recognized, pretty much, it kind of seems like my to-do list was make everything. Okay, cool. <laughs> Create the world. Create the world, yeah. <laughs> got that? Checked them all you off. You thought God your doesn't... to-do list was hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course, I'm not that it was hard for him, but you know. I'm, and I'm pretty sure God didn't go back and be like, hey, I also did this and add it to the list later. Uh, no, I think he got it done <laughs> on time. But he rested on the seventh day because he recognized I got done what I was looking to get done. And I think we, from the same thing, laziness can help in that just the mere making a checklist, making a to-do list of these are the things that I really have to get done. And these are the things I'd like to get done. And if you can get all the things you have to, and some of the things you'd like to get done, wow, the weekend hits, you go, I feel great. This feels amazing because I don't have to beat myself up and look at all the things that I didn't get done because I accomplished it. So yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of the to-do list and it also it's yeah, there's dopamine involved, there's a lot of there's motivation involved. You can share that with somebody else and get accountability. There's a lot of things that can help from that to combat laziness. Well, and the last thing I'll say is just it, it helps to keep a proper perspective of what did God put you on this earth for? God didn't put you on this earth so you could catch up on the latest season of, you know, fill in the blank, right? God did not put you on this earth so you could be up to date on all the latest TikTok videos. Is there anything, well, maybe not TikTok, but is there anything wrong with those things? Maybe not necessarily, but what did God put you on this earth to do? He put you on the, you know, the, the purpose for your life to, to make a living, to have dominion, to, to love your family, to be there with your family. Those are the things that matter. And again, it's not wrong to enjoy entertainment. It's not wrong to enjoy yourself. But again, if, 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 if a large percentage of your time is spent doing things that God really didn't put you on this earth for, that's something to consider as well. That's an interesting point you make because people will look at it and go, well, work was part of the fall. No, it wasn't. Work was given before the fall. It was made harder because of the fall. Tend and keep the garden. Correct. It was made harder because of the fall. You'll not have weeds. Interestingly, same thing with the woman. Childbearing was not part, you know, like, and her submitting to her husband was not part of the fall. It was just going to get a lot harder for her to do it. The childbearing would get a lot harder and her submitting to her husband would get a lot harder. But those were things that were already set in place. Work was intended from the beginning in the perfect world he was given work. Work is a is a fantastic thing that we were, it's a blessing from God. And laziness is looking at it and going, no, that's not a blessing. I would rather sit and do nothing. And laziness is horrible for mental health. It's horrible for the emotions. It's horrible for 
motivation and all sorts. It, it creates depression, and, and depression then feeds into the laziness. Uh, it's, it's really bad, but it's very easy for us to allow ourselves to slip into that. And I think you look at the world today, so many of the women are on antidepressants. So many people are struggling with depression in general. Why? We lack purpose and we lack work. Everything that used to be difficult, we have automated and made it very easy. Um, and so instead of me going out and having to kill a deer so we could eat that night, I just run through McDonald's and eat fattening food. And there's no, like, I don't get the the rush of, wow, I did this for myself. I feel really good. The self-esteem boost, all of that. I don't get that. Right, where I, like that automation should have made it to where we can do bigger, better, more things. It's, well, that's already taken care of, so now I don't have to do anything. And then... Again, we get frustrated with ourselves because we know that deep down. I think to the housework side of it, I, I mentioned specifically for the women, there's an interesting documentary out um, talking about how feminism really got worse and took off when women, everything was automated for them. When they started getting washers and dryers instead of having to wash their clothes manually. When they started getting um, microwaves and things that could do things very quickly for them, they actually started losing purpose because it used to be like, man, I got a lot to do, and they feel really good about it, and vacuums and everything else. It took what was a difficult job, and it made it easy, and instead of giving them more time, it gave them more restless, kind of lazy time, and it didn't go well, and so they ended up getting restless and wanting to go to work, and it kind of kicked off the feminist movement, which I thought was a fantastic and, and a very interesting idea, and I can't really disagree with it. I think it's the same for us, that the less, the more automated our lives are, the more lazy we've gotten when in, it should have been the exact opposite. You heard it here first, folks. Get rid of your washer and dryer, according Vacuums, to Joe Wilkie. Dishwasher. Microwaves. That's right. Hot takes you, with Joe. Back you better be. You better be shooting and not. Don't, don't go with these rifles that can shoot two miles. Be a real man. Do some sporting hunting and get your uh, muzzle loader out. Um, the way bow and arrow. <laughs> bow and arrow. Yeah. yeah. Why, or or just a knife. I mean, can you can slingshot? Just... <laughs> <laughs> Are we allowed a horse? That's some rock. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> How much automation are we getting rid of? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we had a, a segment we're going to add on to the end of each one. We want to hear from the deep thinkers. We always kind of put a generic, oh, give us any feedback. No, we, we actually want to uh, bring about some discussion. We don't have a name for this segment, do we? No, and if any of our listeners have, a, have an idea for the – basically what we want is a question every single episode for you as the listeners to, put, to give your input on. Sometimes, depending on the episode – those questions will be a little bit uh, spicier than others. Um, but, uh, yeah, we need a name for it, to Jack's point. So if you have a creative segment name for this question that we're going to ask every episode, then let us know. But, Jack, go for it. What, what's the question that we're asking for this episode? Yeah, which of these, or uh, you can add one of your own, I guess, but we, we've gone over five here. Which of these do you think is the most pressing for Christians today, for, for your church, for your environment, for yourself, your family? However you want to answer that, which is the most pressing today? So once again, and to recap, looking at the five here, just so everybody can remember as we went, because we go off a little all over the place, that's deception, coveting slash greed, gossip, bitterness slash grumbling, and laziness uh, are, are the five that we chose. As Jack said, you may have a different, uh, a different one you would add, but yeah, what's the most pressing one? What's the biggest one facing the church today? The one that you think is the biggest, maybe the biggest threat facing the church or facing your family or, or something. I think that's, uh, we would love to get feedback from you guys specifically on that. And as Jack said, let us also know your feedback on what sort of, what do you want to call this segment? We have the deep thinkers, which I think I finally got right. That's the first time I've gotten it right in one. You don't call um, them the think deepers the, anymore. The think deepers anymore. <laughs> it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, but we uh, are going to call on our deep thinkers you, you screwed me up. <laughs> you messed me up there. Um, but we're going to call on, on our listeners and say, what would you like this to be called? We'll give you a little input, but we'd love your feedback on that. What's the biggest one facing church today? Fellas, anything else that we want to add before we wrap this one up? All right. Well, thank you for listening. We appreciate uh, we appreciate your listening. And once again, reach out on social media. Let us know about the men's group. Uh, just a quick reminder, let us know about the men's group. If that's something you're interested in, reach out Facebook, email us, contact us, um, send us a letter. Um, get, you know, get on your horse and smoke uh, signals. Do the, yeah, smoke signals. <laughs> yeah, Pony Express. However, you want to do it. And we will talk to you guys next week.